and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the panel, Hassan. I run a software company in automotive domain. We are specialized in safety and security. So this area we work most of the time. And today, what I'm gonna talk about is not really you know, the things that we have seen uh, time and time again, because most of the stuff, I've, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper than that. I'm gonna start with the agenda. So I'm gonna talk about how safety and security are different in autonomous vehicle, that's number one. The challenges that we have the so-called unknown unknown in, in autonomous vehicle, and um, the, 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 the joint approach of ISO and SAE that's leading toward some, some kind of standardization. This is like the main agenda. And like I said, most of the things I wanted to say about these things all are already been said, and so let's see. What can I give you more? Now, let me take you back in time. In um, September 26, 1983, this is a historical, this is a phenomenal day for uh, the human race. What happened was in the 80s, as we know, the world was in the midst of Cold War. Soviets developed a nuclear launch detection system, an AI-based nuclear launch detection system. On this very day, their system detected a launch. So it was a crazy situation in the whole world. Now, fortunately, this gentleman right here, Lieutenant Colonel Petrov, who was in duty somewhere near Moscow, felt there's something not right about this. And he looked into it, and he found that this was a false alarm. Now, imagine what would have happened if this gentleman could not detect this. His human intuition, his gut feeling was not in the place. The human in the loop save the day. Otherwise, it would have been counter-strike. You launch nuclear weapon, we, we launch nuclear weapon back. So the whole world would have been in a nuclear warfare. So here, human in the loop saved us from a nuclear warfare. So let's take a moment to think about it. When we're talking about autonomous vehicle, we want to, but when we're talking about level four, we want to eliminate the human in the loop. That's what we want to do. Now, the traditionally, we, when we talk about ISO 26262 and all sorts of safety standards we've been doing, we have three matrix, like we look at exposure, how likely uh, is the hazard is the hazard, and then we look at uh, then we look at controllability, which is like if, if we can control the thing, uh, control the hazard, and we look at the severity, how, what is the impact. Now, when we talk about controllability, we talk about a human. A human will take it over. So is it controllable by a human? So now we're moving the human part from the equation. What happens to the controllability? So that's a challenge. Let's hold on to this for a moment and think about it. Let's go to aviation industry for now because this is, um, this is an industry where autopilot has been there for a long, long time. Although the scenario for AV and, uh, and autopilot is much different, it's a much simpler scenario and they have been working for, for decades. Now, on my flight from Munich to LA, I happened to sit beside a gentleman who was a Lufthansa pilot and I was talking to him about my talk. You know, I, I work with safety and security and that kind of stuff, as autonomous vehicle. So how about you guys? I mean, you, you have autopilot for a long time. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. So what he was saying is, as a human, the, the plane is a huge object, right? It's huge. He can feel, as a pilot, what's happening in the tail. He gave an example that, that intrigued me. So there is this such sensor, there is a sensor that tells you the angle of attack. And if somehow, because of icing condition or whatever, that sensor is not working, he can feel it because he's a human. He knows that this is, this is the angle, but my sensor is telling me something, he can, he can feel it. And within a within couple of seconds, he can override that. 
right? That kept me thinking that we want to, element level four is no, no human. As we know, I mean, we're, we're, I'm lots of jokes I'm tempted to make. In automotive industry, we want the safety, which is like statistically where our safety is more at stake, and we want the same kind of safety, but that in the aviation industry, they spend 30,000 for an ECU, and we want the same safety for $10. So that's another challenge, but I'm not going there. The question is, like so far what I'm talking about is the need of human, but we have seen from lane keeping and many, many other scenarios where the AI is much better, much more precise than a human. So the question is, when is human better than AI? And when is AI better than human? Because there are certain scenarios where we know that AI will behave better. And of course, we have the fear of AI invasion. But in the previous talks, I'm fully with the, with the idea that AI is going to save more lives than, 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 than anything else. So what, I, what we proposed is a human AI interface. You know, this is where the level three, uh, the example from Mercedes uh, was given. They did an amazing job, the, hu the human AI interface, you know, when to take it over. Because again, from aviation industry, we know that most of the fatalities happen when we see uh, that there is a confusion. If the autopilot is in charge or the pilot is in charge. That's why there was a lot of debate about level three. There are some OEMs, they said, we don't want to go to level three. We'll just skip the level three and go to level four. Now we are seeing level three in reality because this is important. But there are certain, certain, uh, certain aspects where we need the human, the human in the loop, like the way we see. We've seen uh, the world was saved because of, because of the human in the loop. This has been our basis for safety. This has been there for a while. And this was ISO 26262 was focusing on fatality, uh, focusing on malfunctioning. If something goes wrong, what do we do? Now, we know that there are things beyond malfunction. Like, the best example, or the analogy is, imagine that you have a knife to chop vegetables. Now, if you're chopping vegetable and by mistake you chop your finger, the knife is not malfunctioning. It's working perfectly okay, but you're just doing something that it's not intended for. And that's why we have ISO 21448, SODIF, safety of intended functionality. And that's going beyond malfunctioning. Now here's another point that I want to address in safety that we shouldn't forget is the unknown unknown. And this is where the limitation of the ISO 21448 is. We had malfunction that has limitation. Now we have ISO 21448. We don't know that we don't know what to do with the unknown unknown. If we know something, we can we can take measure. But how do you, how do we deal with the unknown unknown? And there is another aspect that still a lot of people when I talk to my clients I hear that statement that, hey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a functional safety manager. I have nothing to do with cybersecurity. I mean, that makes me crazy because the statement he just made is mathematically wrong. What he said is, if there is a cyber attack and he's, he, he's, a person gets injured, as a safety manager, he's not responsible for that. So that is still the case. That's, that's happening everywhere. So cyber attack is something that we used to see in Hollywood, like you know, this is a this is a screen capture for Fast and Furious Eight, where uh, they they take control of thousands of zombie cars and they can make cars rain. So this is Hollywood, but in 2015, this Hollywood became reality. We've seen the uh, Charlie Miller and Natal. They Fortunately, this was in the lab setting. What they, what they did is they could take control of the cars, and that's happening. So this can be weaponized. I mean, this, is, this, is, this goes beyond any, any other threats that you can imagine in the safety domain. This goes beyond anything. So this is something that has to be also taken into consideration. So 
These are the three standards that at my company, Matrix, we work with. You know, we spe we're specializing, our, we, serve, we cater to our clients to solve the problems of these three. There are many other standards which, you know, there are so many ISO numbers these days, and those are needed. But I think these three are fundamentals, and, you know, I'm your go-to person if you need any help in these three standards. Now, the, the, now the final question that uh, was addressed already this morning, and there were a lot of s stimulating conversation, how safe is safe enough? So again, like I said, I mean, I, what I, whatever I wanted to say, most of the stuff has already been said, so let me try. How safe is safe enough? Phil Cookman's book did an amazing job writing about that. You know, how safe is safe enough? I highly recommend you to read this book. I've taken a, taken a quote from his book where, like I said, it's already time. So we're, tr we're tr talking about the matrix is at least as safe as a human behavior. My previous speaker was perfectly, say exactly the same thing. It's not straightforward. It's much more complex than it might even seem. Which human driver? Under what condition? And there are many other questions here, right? So um, the goal is to at least behave as good as the human, or probably we want to get better. Now, again, like my previous speakers, they said, there is, there is no standard. We, I mean, how good are we behaving? How, how good are we driving? We don't know that. We simply don't know that. Let's look at some data. So this is the global, global fatality, 1.35 million today. And this is big, most of them are human drivers. You know, now th this means one person in every 23 seconds is killed from a car accident. Now, if we, if we say that if we can reach that matrix, uh, when, when uh, it will be all AV, are we good? I don't know, I, I think we should aim definitely better. If we can do any better than this 10%, 20%, that is safe enough, but how do we know that? That's the question here. So, what we need and what we don't have is data. Now, how much data is enough to say, now we know AV is safe enough? So there are different opinion, and I'm gonna talk about some of the very interesting cases that intrigues me. So Toyota has an ambitious plan of gathering test data for 8.8 .8 billion miles. They have even created, their testing will go in three phases. First, simulation, then they will go to artificially created environment. They have uh, created an environment in uh, 175 acres of land where they will be driving their cars, and then in the, in, the, in the wild, in the real roads. So that can be one approach, but how did they come up with this number? You know, some people are saying 10, 10, uh, 10 billion. Some people are saying much less. So we don't really know, but we need data. So, Here's one, another thing before I end and let you ask me some questions. I want to talk about one of my very favorite author, Yuval Noah Harari, and he says that, you know, there's, we're, we're afraid of changes. The only constant that will be changes. So now, he mentions a very interesting story here, which comes from a very, very different, different, um, different domain. So in 2002, there was a child born in Michigan, and her name was Alina. Alina had, is the first human being with three biological parents. Her biological parents had a, had a genetic disease, and that's why they replaced their, uh, a part of their DNA with another person to cure her from that disease. Immediately, there was a lot of controversy in the United States, and this kind of procedure was banned. Now, 10 years later, in United Kingdom, this procedure was legalized in 2012. Now, what he's trying to say is this is gonna happen anyway. We'll see AV, we'll see cyber attacks, we will see safety fatalities, this is gonna happen anyway, no matter if we think it's right or wrong. 
It's gonna happen anyway, changes are gonna happen, but we're always scared of changes. But changes will remain the way uh, everything changes, but changes will be the only constant. So the message is that AV is going to happen no matter if, it is, if, we, if we make it safe or not. It's gonna, we don't know how, we, we really do not know how safe is safe enough. And it will we'll happen gradually. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be moving toward gradually. Now, a little bit about me, the thoughts that I've given to you is actually from my, my book, that I'm, this is my second book that I'm authoring. Uh, this will be published in June, A Brief History of Autonomous Vehicle. Uh, here's my contact. I host a podcast called Autonomous Vehicle Safety and Security Podcast. Please feel free to check out in, in uh, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and every other channel. If you have any question, I'll be more than happy to take them. How do you go? Oh, yeah. This one? Yes, thank you. Do you have any questions? No? Thank you. I love questions. Thank you. You're welcome. So what are the implications of safety and security for autonomous vehicles? This, was a, this is a very good question. Um, I already answered it in the panel today that you know, for the first time in history, I'm so excited that safety and security is gonna be the enabler of a revolutionary uh, technology. In my opinion, after the industrial revolution, AV is gonna be the biggest societal change in our, in, for, for humankind, and that is gonna be enabled by safety and security. So safety and security has enormous impact and in AV. Uh, traditionally, we have seen that technology moves faster, but then we realize, hey, we have to make it safe and secure and so on. But this time, it's going to be the other way around. Okay, and so can safety goals be in contradiction to security goals? And how do we mitigate that? That's a great question. The answer is yes. You know, uh, we have seen uh, safety goals in odds with security goals. One classic example is uh, in a safe mode, you should be able to open the doors of your, unlock the doors of your car. And a car thief can use that feature to steal your car. So they're in odds, right? So there can be contradiction, there are contradictions, so that's why safety and security has to be, has to be hand in hand. Like, Security is a superset of safeties. Security has like four impacts. It, has, it can have financial impact, it can have operational impact, it can have privacy impact, and safety impact. So the safety impact part of it and the safety guys, they have to work hand in hand in order to mitigate those problems. Right. Any other questions? Great, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.